So last week we began talking about Philippians. I'll apologize if I repeat anything from last week because I um, things got moved around in my sermon, so I don't remember everything that uh, I shared, and I should have watched the video because I didn't follow my notes last week at all. So I don't know that I talked to you about the, the why of Philippians. How did the church at Philippi even come about? And we can find this out in Acts. So as we're studying a book, we want to also cross-reference. We want to study um, the other parts in the Bible where that book comes from. And in Acts 16, that's where the church at Philippi is essentially founded by, by Paul. Paul is... Uh, is I can't remember where he was at this point, um, but he gets called um, in a dream. Somebody, there's a person talking to him saying, come to Macedonia to speak the good news. Uh, Paul and his team had not been sure where to go. God kept closing doors. And then all of a sudden he, um, he, he has this dream of somebody saying, come to Macedonia to preach the good news. So they go to Macedonia. They end up in uh, the city of Philippi. And while they're in the city of Philippi, several things happen. Now, this is the story of Lydia, the woman who deals in purple. So she's a woman of wealth. They go into Philippi. There is no synagogue because there's not enough Jewish men to have a synagogue, but they're all praying down by the river. So he goes down. He meets with this group of believers who are praying together. Lydia's one of them. She invites him back to the house, his team. And uh, from there, the church at Philippi is born. Now, also in Philippi is where we see the uh, young slave girl who is following Paul and Titus and Timothy around, uh, saying these are men who are coming to tell you about the Most High God and how you can be saved. And she just keeps shouting this over and over and over. And, you know, Paul, normally good-natured and fun, fun-loving and happy-going, uh, gets a little ticked and says, evil spirit, be gone out of her. And he casts this demon out of her. Um, side note, if you think stuff at Lilydale is just fun and there's no big deal, all right, this is what this girl was doing. This is fortune telling. She was, so at best it's a scam. At worst, this is a demonic thing going on. And in this case, this was a demonic thing going on. You don't play with that stuff. And Paul didn't play with that. Paul cast that demon out of her. Well, her owners are very unhappy because this cost them a lot of money. This is how they were making their living off this uh, slave girl telling people's fortunes. So they get upset, they go to the, the authorities, and they have Paul arrested. So Paul and Silas are in prison, they're chained to, uh, their hands and legs are, are chained. And then later on that evening, they're singing praise to God, and I don't know how many of you in prison would be singing songs of praise to God, but that's where they're at. They're singing these songs of praise to God when all of a sudden an earthquake comes, shakes that building, knocks the doors right off the hinges, and their chains are broken right off. The guard gets there the next morning and sees what has happened. And he takes out his sword. He's going to kill himself because that's what's going to happen anyways. In Rome, if you're a guard and your prisoners escape, your life is forfeited for the lives that you lost, for those prisoners you lost. But Paul yells out to him, don't harm yourself. We are all still here. The doors had opened, the chains had come off, and yet they stayed. God had them there for a purpose. And that guard would eventually come to know Christ. Now they had been beaten before this time, so at the end of chapter 16, the authorities of Philippi, they come and they want to send them away quietly, kind of let's just get them out of here. And Paul says, oh no, oh no, we're not leaving that easily. We are Roman citizens and you beat us publicly and you can't do that. He said, you will come and you will apologize and, and you will bring us out. <clears throat> and that's what the authorities did. They came and they apologized and pretty much begged them, look, just, just leave quietly, okay, just, just go. So he goes back to Lydia's, they go back to Lydia's 
home and encourage the, the, the new, this new church there, and then they leave. And that is where we get the church at Philippi. Now later on, Paul is going to be in prison again. This time he's in Rome. It's believed he's in Rome. We're not 100% sure, but we believe this was his last imprisonment in Rome. And he's writing to the church at Philippi again. And that's where we're going to be today. So if you want to open with me, we are in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Excuse me. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. That we can know you not because we're just making things up, because you have revealed to us who you are and who we are in you, Father. We pray that today you would speak to us through your word. Whether through my words or in spite of them, speak to each one of us here today. Wherever we're at, speak today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the beginning of our passage starts out, Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So what has happened to Paul? Like I said, Paul at this time is believed to be in a Roman prison. So it's not the same as that prison in Philippi. Right now, he is in a prison where it's actually under kind of house arrest in the palace, which means that he's most likely chained to a guard all the time. He can come and go as long as that guard allows him to, so he, if that guard will go with him, he can do what he needs to do or wants to do. Most of the time, people who were under house arrest, they still had to come up with their own food, their own clothing, and um, take care of themselves. Paul, being a Roman citizen, was, had a right to food rations, and, um, but he had to have his brothers and sisters bring those to him, so he had to rely on people to bring those rations to him. So it's not the type of prison like where he was in Philippi, but it is still a prison. He is still limited 
in what he could do. You see, Paul, in these chains, had very real limitations. For many of us today, we too are in chains. Paul's chains were physical. Our chains can be many other things. We could have some physical things going on that limit us. Could be some emotional stuff going on that limits us. Could be some financial stuff going on at home that limits us. But each one of us has limitations. Have you ever really thought about that? What are your limitations? And you all know them. At the very least, you know them in the back of your mind because it's what stops you from being all that God has created you to be. It's what stops you from maybe stepping out of your comfort zone and doing what he's calling you to do. Maybe your limitation is fear. Maybe it's, I don't know enough. I can't go and share the gospel with somebody because what if they have a question for me that I can't answer? What if I don't have the right words to say? We each have these limitations that as long as we allow them to, they, they hold us back. One time, and I, I don't often share stuff like this, and I don't think I've shared this here. I've only shared this with a few people. Years ago, I had a vision, and I was working at Quality Markets. I was doing payroll, of all things, so I'm sitting at a computer, and I've been talking to God and asking him to reveal himself to me, to reveal what he, where I was at, where, just something, reveal to me something. And it was the strangest thing because suddenly it was like I was having this dream that I had no control over, and yet I was awake. And in this vision, I was chained to a chair. And it was dark. I couldn't see only so far. There was like a light just on me. And I was chained there, and I'm looking out, but I could see light out in the distance, like a row of just a, a horizon of light. And I knew that that was where I needed to be, that I needed to go that direction, but I was chained to this chair. And then all of a sudden, I look down and I realize that I'm not actually chained to that chair, that I had held myself to that chair, that I was free to go to where I knew, knew I needed to go at any time. But for some reason, I was just stuck there. And that's kind of how that ended. And I prayed afterwards, and I said, God, what does that mean? What are you talking about? And God revealed to me that that chair, those chains that I had put on myself that I was holding on to was the world. There were so many things in this world that I was tied to and refused to let go of and that I'd never be able to get where I needed to be as long as I held on to the things of this world. My friends, for some of us, those are the chains that are holding us back. You know what your chains are. If you're honest with yourself, you know what those chains are. But all is not lost with our chains. You see, Paul tells us that his chains are serving a purpose. His chains are not a limitation that, is, that he is unable, that is unable to be overcome. There is actually, God is actually still using his chains for a purpose. And we know the word of God tells us that I work all things for the good of those who love me. Paul's chains were being used to build the kingdom in verses 12 through 14, Paul says, 
what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. <clears throat> those chains held Paul back, but those chains were not holding God back. God was still using him to build the kingdom. I wanted to share um, a story about people from our church. We have a couple from our church who, they can't be here anymore for physical reasons, but they watch faithfully every week online. And, and I think I've shared this before recently, but I'm just amazed by them, which is why I, I share. <clears throat> despite the fact that they can't be here, and despite the fact that that, in, in a sense, that breaks their hearts, they struggle with that because they were very active in the church when they were here. But even though they can't be here, God is using them to continue to build the kingdom. They are prayer warriors from their home. I think I may have shared a few weeks ago how um, just blessed and humbled I was when I was visiting with them and they, inf they were asking about my family, the things they had been praying for from a long time uh, before. And uh, they told me we pray for you twice a day. And I believe that those prayers are being answered. I believe that God hears their prayers and is working through these two individuals. Despite their limitations, God is still using them. And I don't know what your limitation is. I don't know what your chains are. Are, but I know that God uses all things to the good of those who love him, and all things will be used for his glory. Because when it comes down to it, we have one focus, and our focus is Christ. Christ is all that matters. Paul says that when he says, who cares what their motives are? Who cares if they're doing it for selfish reasons or if they're doing it for noble purposes? All that matters is Christ. Christ preached. Christ exalted Christ lived. Christ preached because the important thing is we need to continue to preach the good news. Paul was in chains, but he didn't stop sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, even with those guards. And all of the Praetorian guards, he says, they knew why I was there. They knew that I was in chains for Christ. I am confident it's because Paul was sharing the good news with them every moment of the day. Whether in his life or through his words, he was sharing with those guards. People need to know. We have friends, we have loved ones who don't know Christ. And I don't know about you, but I don't know how I would make it through the day without Christ. It is him who gives me strength. I'm too old to have four kids, by the way. <laughs> it is Christ who gives me strength to be with them every day. I'm not naturally gifted to be in something like this, to be a campus pastor at this church but Christ is working every day. I don't know how I'd make it through the day without him. 
And I know we won't make it through eternity without him. I want to see my loved ones again. When that day comes, and I have two funerals to do this week, and this is what we're going to talk about, <clears throat> that because both of these funerals are people who knew Christ, that if we know Christ one day too, we will sit down at the table with them again. Christ must be preached. Christ must be exalted. Paul says, Christ will be exalted in my body. Christ is worthy of our praise. Jesus is worthy of our praise. He is worthy to be exalted. That word exalted there is megaluna. Now we all know mega, right? Mega stores, mega phones, even mega vitamins, which I didn't know about mega vitamins. Apparently, they're especially potent vitamins because we know that mega means large, it means exalted. It means to, to make great, to esteem, to celebrate. God is worthy of our praise. He is worthy to be exalted because no matter what we say about God, we will never over-exaggerate. He is worthy to be praised. Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed but will have sufficient courage so now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So what does that mean? No matter what, Paul is saying, I will live a life worthy of Christ. He will be exalted by my words. He will be exalted by my deeds, by my action. Because he is worthy to be praised. And therefore, Paul will live as Christ. Because Christ should be lived. Paul says to live as Christ, but to die as gain. It's no big deal if we know Christ to die because we will spend eternity with him. We will be with him. The hard part is that first part. To live is Christ. To live is to put him first. One of the commentators wrote this, and I loved how it was worded. If I live, I live my life in fellowship with Jesus. I live to please him and to do his will. I have opportunity to bear fruit, to lay up treasures in heaven. Christ should be lived in our lives. Christ must be preached. He must be exalted. And he must be lived out each and every day of our lives. We are Christ to the world. So our challenge today, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our chains, how are we glorifying Christ? And, you know, we cannot glorify Christ if we do not know him. We cannot know Christ if we don't seek him. We must seek Jesus through prayer, through scripture, through fasting, through all the means of grace that we talk about over and over and over again. These are the ways that we draw near to God one of those ways is what we're going to join together in now. It's that time of communion. I encourage you, don't let this just be a time of a little bread and juice that we just take it because everyone's taking it. Let this be a time where we are coming expectantly, expecting Jesus to show up. Expect, expecting to sense his presence, to know that he is here revealing himself to us. 
We'll begin with a little bit of time of meditation that we can have some time alone with God to talk about where we're at. Then we'll confess and then I'll ask uh, our greeters to, or our servers to come up in a minute here. But let's begin that in prayer. Let's pray Psalm 139 and I'll give you a moment to talk to God and then we'll, we'll pray Psalm 51. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in us and lead us in the path everlasting. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions, wash away all of our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sins. Forgive us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for showing up today. We thank you for allowing us to partake in this heavenly banquet, that we can have a foretaste of what it will be like when we are celebrating together in your presence. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your work in our lives as you make us who you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.